my job as a machinist on the ship um, that carried 2,000 Marines and all their equipment was essentially to fix it if it was broke or make it if it didn't exist. You know, um, Lowe's and Home Depot don't really have any stores out in the middle of the Persian Gulf. All right, Richard, right? Yep. <laughs> pleasure to meet you, man. Thank you for being here, brother. My pleasure, man. All right, um, let's just start off by just telling me a little bit about um, uh, where you were born and raised and just about your upbringing. So um, I was born and raised um, here in uh, Roanoke, Virginia, the, uh, the, the, the star city. Nice. Um, and uh, I was raised um, pretty much here in Roanoke, um, the surrounding areas. Um, my folks split up when I was two, um, so I was between mom and dad for a few years. Um, I think they were separated for about five or six years, and then they got back together when I was like eight. Um, and then had my kid sister, um, and we were pretty much raised in Daleville, um, behind World Botetourt High School, um, from like fourth grade on until now, which is where my folks still live. Um, so yeah, um, born and raised around here, went to high school um, around here, and uh, Hated high school. Uh, there was, yeah. there was, there was. Um, I was more interested in running track, chasing girls, and fixing up my big truck. Um, yeah. But when I say chasing girls, I was the guy that was friends with all the cheerleaders, but not trying to sleep with them. Yeah. Um, you know, the guy that would, took choir and was in poetry class. So to all the jocks, I was, you know, I was gay or yeah. I was some fag. Um, but you know, that never really was the case. I just, um, I don't know, just different. And you just that, enjoyed and, it. And, yeah, and that's okay. But. Yeah, high school was hell. Um, I, I hated it. There was a lot of bullying um, and such, um, but um, I guess it all happens for a reason. And you know, I kind of it changed my perspective on a lot of things um, growing up. What type of, uh, if you don't mind diving into that, what what type of bullying did you have to deal with in high school? Um, there were uh, a handful of instances where just you know, um, jocks. Um, just didn't like me because I was different and one of one of the main ones that I can recall is I, I was dating a girl like freshman year you know just that kitty love or whatever you want to call it and uh, we were messing around and stuff you know like like kids do um, and she ended up starting a rumor that I raped her and that turned my world upside down I, there were friends, mutual friends of both of ours that knew that there was no way that's possible. I'm the guy that picks up spiders and takes them outside. Mm -hmm. You know, I, it, I'm not capable of such a thing. You know, if anything, there was a little bit more pressure on her end than it was my end when we were goofing around and experimenting. But needless to say, um, you know, we ended up, um, you know, breaking up and then she went and dated a friend of mine and then she ended up dating half the football team or something like that. Um, at least um, that was my impression. And, uh, the next four years were hell because, you know, I guess that rumor stuck around or whatever and I got that bad taste in the mouth of the jocks and so they just rode me hard for the next few years. Um, and it wasn't fun. There, fortunately, there was nothing too physical um, because I had a, a big brother of sorts. Um, it was a close friend of mine that um, was a crazy motherfucker um, yeah. and everybody knew that he would fight a brick wall and win. Right. Um, and he always kind of had my back and so folks kind of knew not to take it too far with me because they knew that you know my big brother would had my back essentially and so they kind of created a lot of mental anguish for me but fortunately it wasn't really too much physical um, but that kind of turned me pretty passive um, that and just some childhood trauma you know with uh, my folks and just some minor abuse there but um, you know, I, 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 I've never been a fan of violence. Um, I, don't, I don't like violence of any sort. And I, and, I, and I think that a lot of the issues that we have in this world, especially regarding war um, and, and anything violent, I think they boil down to communication. Um, you know, communication or lack thereof, and then, you know, religious preferences. And don't get me started on that. But um, it's like if uh, you and Chuck Norris got in an argument, right? Um, and you're like, hey Chuck, the sky is blue. He's like, nah, dude, it's purple with like polka dots. You're like, no, that's it's it's blue, and at nighttime it's black, and those aren't polka dots, those are stars. He's like, nah, dude, it's purple, and those are polka dots, and you're wrong, and I'm gonna kick your ass if you say different. 
like, no, Chuck, you're wrong. All right, boom. And then a fight breaks out. You know, who's going to win? You or Chuck? Chuck's going to kick your ass. But my <laughs> point is, um, you know, that doesn't prove who's right or wrong. It only proves who's the better fighter. Right. Um, and so communication, I feel like, is, 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 is huge. And um, so I've never been a fan of violence because um, I just don't feel like it's really solving the problem at hand. It's just who's got, you know, the bigger gun. And my grandfather was in the Navy, so um, I went to the recruiting office and um, they asked me, um, would you like to see uh, the world and um, meet a bunch of girls? They might have they might have said, or get laid or something like that. And, you know, I was an 18-year-old kid and I was like, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. So, um, yeah, joined the Navy out of high school um, so that my folks wouldn't have to pay for college and um, I just wasn't sure what I wanted to be. Wow. Then I became a, a machinist, yeah. A machinist for the Navy? Yeah, yeah, I became a machinist for the Navy. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do when I went to the Navy and I sat in the uh, recruiting office for hours going through all these different jobs that the Navy had. Um, and they got around to machinist stuff and I think they mentioned blueprints. And in high school I took a drafting class that was um, um, essentially drawing the blueprints, um, whether it be um, you know via drawing board and pencil and rules and, and stuff like that, or we dabbled in, in some computer aided drafting back then. Um, but I heard blueprints and I heard machinists, and I recall my grandfather was a machinist for the railroad, and so those two kind of things clicked, and I was like, yeah, fabrication, blueprints, machining, so cool, I'll do that. Nice. Um, so. I decided to be a machinist and went off to uh, to boot camp um, and uh, machinist A school and um, where'd you go to boot camp at? Uh, boot camp in Great Lakes, Illinois, okay. um, and my machinist A school was also in Great Lakes, Illinois, um, and you know that was a, a wide awakening. It was a culture shock for sure. Um, joining the military um, when I was in high school, there may have been four people of color in my graduating class, um, maybe if yeah. that. I mean, it was predominantly you know all white, um, and I grew up raised kind of more on the conservative side. You know, my folks were were more definitely way more red than they are blue. Um, probably not even any shades of purple. It was mostly red. Um, and um, that was just my perspective growing up. That's really all I knew. That's what I thought was right without really forming my own opinion, if you will. Right. Um, and when I joined the Navy, um, and f my first day on my ship, um, the ship that I was assigned to, um, I was greeted by this little, um, this little man that was really tan and, and had different looking eyes and dark hair. Um, and had a weird accent that I wasn't familiar with. And, and my first glance, I thought he was kind of of Hispanic origin or something along those lines. Come to find out he was Filipino. And at that time, I couldn't tell you where the Philippines was. I, and I didn't quite understand at 18 years old how this Filipino man was part of the U.S. Navy. And, and this was just kind of all new to me, but I knew that he would kind of... a. Uh, uh, he'd cuss me in certain slangs and call me mudapaka um, <laughs> and, and, and give me a hard time. But the Navy introduced me to a lot of different um, people, a lot of different walks of life coming from, um, from all over the world um, to serve in our, in our, in our military. And, and one thing that the Navy taught me and I, um, for sure is that we're all different. We all come from different walks of life, different experiences, et cetera. But in the Navy, what we had to do, or really in the military in general, um, because my ship was an amphibious assault ship, we carried 2,000 Marines and all their equipment, so we were just a big family. And what I learned is that we have to put our differences aside and come together to work towards the common goal. And at that time, you know, we were defending our country, Operation Enduring Freedom, Iraqi Freedom. Um, you know, we all had a job to do, so we had to put our differences aside and work together as a team. And that's. That's a huge takeaway that I got from the Navy. Um, but a huge influence of mine in the Navy was my first roommate. And this was before I even got to my ship. I was in transition from <clears throat> um, my school um, to my ship. And so I had a roommate for a bit. Um, and he was a gay black man. 
um, and I never had met such a combination. You know, I was familiar with the LGBT, LGBTQ community because growing up, my father uh, shared an auto repair shop with um, um, a lesbian um, named um, Val, um, and she was like six foot tall, just this big butch broad who was you know, awesome. And I always knew her as Big Bird. That was my nickname for her. Um, and she was kind of like part of the family. And, you know, I didn't think anything of it. I just knew that her, her partner was, was Darla and like, it was okay. Right. Um, is what it was, you know, it was no big deal. Um, and, and so my, um, my first roommate, uh, Lawrence was a gay black man. And he, um, the Navy found him living basically out of a cardboard box, found him homeless. Um, and he's got a sob story himself that is, is, is pretty rough. Um, but that man, seeing the, the pain that he's you know, been through and, 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 and whatnot, would give you the shirt off his back, even if he pulled it out of the trash himself. And he would do anything to help you, yet still find a way to smile every single day and give back. So he was a huge influence in my life. So you deployed over to OEF and OIF? Is yeah. Okay. Um, I did. Um, so I, my job as a machinist on the ship um, that carried 2,000 Marines and all their equipment was essentially to um, fix it if it was broke um, or make it if it didn't exist. You know, um, Lowe's and Home Depot don't really have any stores out in the middle of the Persian Gulf um, for us to go and, and, and get a part. So. Um, you know, the, the, our ship, you know, being the second largest naval ship in, um, in the fleet um, is like a rolling city, um, or floating city rather, and so um, we have to keep it in moving order at all time because if, 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 if it stops and if it gets, um, you know, enabled, um, then we're sitting ducks. Um, and so there were a few instances that I can recall where um, something critical on the ship broke um, and I was pulled out of my rack in the middle of the night by this little Filipino man cussing me in a language I didn't understand, saying, you know, mother pucker, we got to go. You know, we got we to fix this now. Um, and I remember, you know, standing in front of a machine for hours and hours and hours on end, machining a part that I had no clue what its function was other than if you don't make this and make it right the very first time, you know, it could be bad. Um, wow. And so that kind of pressure was um, stressful, but yet I thrived in those situations. I really enjoyed those type of situations. Um, we had a, uh, a firefighting team on our ship called the Flying Squad. So basically we would prepare for the event that a missile was to strike us uh, or a sub submarine torpedo or something like that, that um, we would be first on the scene you know, um, you know, general quarters would ring the bells and we would, you know, we would go flying to the, the scene to, 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 to react, whether it be, you know, patching a hole in the ship or fighting a fire uh, or something of that nature. And um, I volunteered to always be the team lead and to be the first one there to be in charge of, of the whole team. Um, and I really thrived on that kind of uh, environment, that kind of pressure that kind of responsibility. I liked being depended on. Um, and yeah, there were a few close calls where um, we were right off the coast of um, maybe Iraq, Afghanistan. It was somewhere over there. Um, and I recall our Marines being deployed. We were close enough to shore to where we could see the action. We could see, um, you know, the, the little flickers of light here and there. Yeah. Um, and there were times where we were told to get dressed out in our full uh, firefighting kit because shit could hit the fan at any minute. Um, and as a 19, 20 year old kid, um, it was kind of exciting at first, but I recall getting dressed out and standing in the, the, the hangar bay of the ship, basically having a clear view of what was going on out there and it was at nighttime so all I could see was flickers of light and thinking to myself like this is kind of cool and all because this is what we've trained for mm -hmm. but if something <laughs> happens like am I gonna see my folks again like is, is this is this real like 
that wasn't a cool feeling. So um, it was in that moment that I gained a whole new respect for veterans like yourself, you know, and all the 2,000 Marines that we had on our ship with us that, you know, we were bitching and complaining so bad about our isolation being on this big metal box for, you know, days on end going, you know, weeks and weeks sometimes without seeing daylight, without knowing what day it even is. It was like Groundhog Day. All we wanted to do was get on land and see sunlight. And all our Marines wanted to do was get on the ship and get away from it. Um, and so I gained a whole new respect for those guys. And, and, and I, I, I love my vets, you know. We all serve a purpose for sure. Um, you know, there's, the, there's the, uh, the back and forth bickering between, you know, Navy and Marines and Army and, and all that stuff. And, you know, the Army-Navy rivalry. Um, and I just laugh at all that because we're all in it to serve a purpose um, and we all do our parts. Um, and, you know, it was a pleasure and an honor to do, to do my part. And me being passive and not really wanting to, to fight, I would have been one of those conscious, conscientious objectors, if you will. Um, um, you know, the medic that didn't carry the gun. I don't know if you've heard the story about that guy. No. Um, but he, ah, damn, I can't remember his name. Um, it's on the tip of my tongue. But um, anyway, he, uh, he fought in, um, I think it was World War II. Um, and he saved over 80 soldiers. Um, he was a medic and he was a conscientious objector and he chose not to touch a gun. Um, did they make a movie about it? It did. I might have. That's, that's, how, that's how I found out about okay. it. And I was just like, that's my dude. Yeah. I was like, if I would have joined, you know, Army or Marines, I was like, that probably would have been me. Um, but then again, Navy's the medics, those are the corpsmen. So, um, but yeah, I love my vets. I respect them. And so I had a few close calls in the Navy like that. Um, there were a few instances where I had to make a mission critical part where if I didn't finish, finish it right the first time, you know, we would have been sitting ducks. I recall one time when we were heading from, uh, we were heading to Iceland, so we were in the North Atlantic. Um, the North Atlantic is very, very, very choppy waters, very choppy, and it's very cold. And usually in the belly of the ship where the engine is, it's really hot. I remember doing heat stress therapy down there, and it was 140 degrees. And so I would have to go to different monitoring stations and measure the temperatures down there so that I could inform the people in charge down there how long they could safely be in that space before they needed to get inside some sort of an air-conditioned space for X amount of time before they could go back out and safely work. And I recall being down there and we were in the North Atlantic and it was cold, like hypothermic cold, because you got to figure your ship is 30-some feet below, below water. Mm -hmm. and we were in the North Atlantic, so it was cold and something mission critical broke below the, the decking that we would walk on. And there's a bilge down there and the bilge is full of piss water because oh. you're, you're nowhere close to a, to, a, to a head, if you will, um, when you're down there. So the sailors would just piss in the bilge because they could open valves and drain it out. And one of the mission critical pieces that broke was down underneath the decking in the bilge. So I recall having to lay in this like hypothermic water to take measurements and go back and forth, back and forth, because there was no accurate way to get a one-time measurement. So we can make this right the first time. I had to go back and forth, back and forth, probably a dozen times. I went through probably half a dozen different pair of coveralls that day, oh. trying to make this mission critical part. Um, you know, laying down in this piss water that was freezing cold, trying to make this piece. But um, long story short, we. Wow. we uh, we, we, we got her done and uh, wow, it was man. it was a, it was a good story to tell my students now um, oh man but um that's wild yeah yeah so i did four years um um in the navy and um i hated ship life it just uh, I, I dipped my toe in the water if you will um i had the opportunity still to go to the naval academy if i wanted to go run for them mm -hmm. um I just needed to make a few phone calls and then go to prep school and go through that whole nine yards. But you know, after my first deployment, I realized the military lifestyle wasn't really what I wanted to do with mm -hmm. my life. Um, I was ready to get back out into the mountains and um, my father had just expanded his 3,500 square foot collision repair shop that I grew up in um, to 13,000 square foot. 
So, you know, going from a shop like this to a shop like this overnight, um, you know, he went from this little mom pop repair shop to needing to know the difference between net and gross profit. Man. Um, and I was 22 years old, knew that my father had just, you know, bought this giant repair shop and he needed help with the transition. Um, and I still wasn't sure what I wanted to be when I grew up, but knew that there was some security in going back home to help the old man with his business. And, and as far as I was concerned then, I was going to be the, um, you know, the boss's son. And I was the, the heir of this auto body empire that he was essentially building. And um, I came home um, and all I knew was, was work ethic because, you know, in the, in the Navy, um, you know, it, it, it didn't stop. You know, we had kind of working hours of sorts, but when we were deployed, it was all hands on deck all the time. Right. You know, you rest when you could. Um, but I recall having to have my wisdom teeth removed while being deployed Oof. and having doctor's orders to, you know, rest and be in bed. And I recall my boss essentially tearing them up, and throwing them in the trash because there were mission critical items that needed to be you know, taken care of. And at the time, I was the only person qualified to do the heat stress down in the main engine compartments to make sure that all the sailors were safe um, down there. Um, and so, you know, doctor's orders in the trash. I'm fresh out of the surgical chair, um, you know, hyped up on oxy. And um, I'm in front of a machine, machining parts, or I'm down in a 140 degree engine room you know, taking heat stress measurements, trying to make sure the rest of my guys were safe. So I had this kind of work ethic instilled in me that it doesn't matter how bad you feel. It doesn't matter how bad your day is going. We have a job to do. Right. And if, if you're the only one qualified to do it, you've, you have an obligation that you have to do it because there's nobody that can do it for you, you know? Um, and so I kind of got that sort of work ethic instilled in me, and it made sense. Um, and it kind of gave me this self-reliance type of mentality. Um, and so I brought that home to the family business. And that was a tough transition because I go home to help my father run his, his, his collision repair facility. And um, we, we grew rapidly. Um, we were, he went from doing you know, a, a couple hundred K uh, a year, maybe, um, in his small little 3,500 square foot shop to um, when we finally shut it down eight years later, we were doing two million a year. And wow. we had 14 employees wow. um, that I was essentially managing. Um, I, when I got to the shop at 22 years old, I, I thought I was gonna start from the bottom and work my way up. I was gonna start by washing cars and helping put them together and doing paint prep and such. But a few months after, after being there, my dad's um, you know, longtime friend and, and makeshift shop manager, if you will, decided it was just too much stress. He couldn't handle it and he bailed and he left. And so here I was as a 22 year old kid having to manage people old enough to be you know, my, my, my parents. Right. Um, and so I dove in head first because that's all I knew was my military background. And so at 22 years old, I was working 80 to 100 hour weeks and I was drinking myself to sleep every night because of the stress and the, and the pressure. Um, the, the, the deeper in it I got, the more I learned about the numbers and, and, and what, it take, what, it, what it took to run a, a, a business like that. If we didn't clear six figures a month, we wouldn't even break even. Um, wow. And you know, for, for, for a lot of people, six figures in a year is, is, is they're stoked. Um, they're doing well. If we didn't do six figures in a month, we were wasting our time. Wow. And so knowing that my father didn't have a 401k or retirement plan, anything like that, all he, all he did was put his life into the business. That's, that, was, that was his everything. Um, it was a lot of pressure for a young kid um, to try to make sure that he was successful. As I mentioned, I became a Freemason because I was looking for something to, to I needed something to fill that void. Um, I, I needed a purpose. Um, um, you know, I didn't want to just work a job and get a paycheck. Speaking of paychecks, um, 
I recall more often than not, I would stuff my paychecks into my desk for, for weeks, sometimes months on end, and not cash them just to make sure that my old man could make payroll. Wow. So that my employees could, that had kids, that had families, could, 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 could you know, keep food on the table. Um, that meant a lot to me. Um, but as a Freemason, I made a friend. His name was Hubert Hobbs, and Hubert Hobbs stormed Normandy. He was one of the Bedford boys. So if you've ever seen the movie Saving Private Ryan, put yourself in that first person perspective and try to imagine what that was like. Hubert lived that, that That's nightmare. Wild. And he made it two or three weeks in before he got shot, medically evac'd or whatever. Um, and that man saw things that we couldn't imagine in our worst nightmares and lived to tell about it. And every single time I would sit down to dinner with that man, I'd say, Brother Hubert, how you doing, man? How's it going, bro? And he'd say, I'm just hanging loose, brother. That's <laughs> all I can do. And so when Hubert passed away at the ripe age of 92, I got hanged loose for Hubert. Do you mind, do you mind walking up here, Rich? So yeah, man. Can put the seat so we can see it. Just go ahead and lift it up a little more. There, there it is. Nice. Hang loose All for right. Hubert. And it's really hard to see because it's faded and old, but there's a Freemason cuff link okay. right here. Okay. But so Hubert, as I mentioned, he saw stuff that we couldn't imagine in our worst nightmares, but yet he lived his entire life to the ripe age of 92 with a smile on his wow. face and giving back everywhere that he could. He had every right to be a, you know, a grumpy old fuck, you know, a sour, salty dude. And, and, and he chose not to be. He chose to keep smiling and to keep hanging loose. Um, and so when he passed away, I decided that my right arm was essentially done. It's a family tree of sorts. Every piece is a different member of my immediate family. And I decided that my left arm was going to be my motivation arm. Um, influential people in my life and just, you know, tattoos of motivation would be on my left arm. And Hubert was the first person um, on that piece. And I've got many more planned, but, you know, time, awesome. time and money. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> That's... Time and money. That's um, awesome. So, yeah, I continued working at Dad's shop. Um, I, uh, you know, same old story. I, I, I kept seeing a therapist um, to deal with, you know, just my, my anxiety and depression. They put me on meds, you know, which seemed to help. I, I still had issues with drinking. It was all situational. Um, you know, I was just using it as a coping mechanism. I, I did some pretty hardcore sports um, that were pretty extreme, but I somehow felt found calm in that chaotic environment. Um, I did a lot of uh, rock climbing, you know, couple thousand foot rock faces. Wow. Um, I did some extreme downhill mountain biking where you're fully covered in like motocross gear, pads from head to toe, full face helmets, and you're going off terrain that's hard to walk down, much less ride a bike down. And I shattered my collarbone. I um, blew out this shoulder and had reconstructive surgery on it. Um, and uh, I was got a random email from a high school friend of mine um, who was a counselor at Radford University um, and she received an email that was circulate, circulating through faculty and staff and it was from a, a student whose vehicle had been severely vandalized and defaced because of his sexual orientation. He was like a high up in a fraternity of sorts whose main goal was in like community service and helping out the community. Um, he was a mentor of sorts to other students, um, like an RA in his, in his dorm. Um, and they slashed his tires, they bashed out his windows, and they keyed die fag in the side of his car. And, you know, me growing up, you know, around Val at our shop, my first roommate being a gay black man, you know, uh, I just, 
I, I, wasn't, I wasn't a fan of what happened to this kid. And my friend reached out to me to tell me about this story of this kid. And she was like, I know you have a repair shop. Do you know anybody that could potentially help him? He's a struggling college kid. His grandparents came out of retirement just to help him get through college. He doesn't have the money to fix this car. And I said, send him to my shop. I want a meeting and I want to find out, you know, I want to hear his story. And as soon as I met the kid and saw his car, I was like, dude, this isn't cool. Like, um, I'll fix your car. I'll fix it for free. I, I, I'll figure out a way. Wow. Um, I knew that with my network of vendors um, and, and, and parts guys and employees and friends, uh, I knew that I had the ability to fix his car and it wouldn't really cost me anything but time. And granted, I was working 80 to 100 hour weeks and, and you know, uh, was in a new marriage, uh, had bought a house. Um, I just, I had to make it work. And um, I put probably two or three weeks of just nonstop um, work into this kid's car and, and, and I couldn't just leave well enough alone. I had to uh, go above and beyond and not only fix the damage on his car, but we, we overhauled it um, and we um, put new, new tires on it. I had his wheels powder coated and refurbished. I did an all over paint job on it, new glass in it. We tinted the windows, did some custom interior, put a stereo system in it, a security system in it, um, all new suspension, tune up. Um, you know, I wanted this kid to know that, you know, what happened to him wasn't right and that bullying and bigotry of any sort is, is not cool. Um, and, you know, it, it needed to be addressed and that. I'm here to break stereotypes and let you know that, you know, uh, a young white male in the automotive industry that was raised in the South from a conservative family um, is here to tell you that it's okay to be gay, it's okay to be colorful and paint your fingernails, and it's okay to, um, you know, be different. Um, and, and I'm here to, to stand up for that. Um, and so my grandfather, my grandmother, rest in peace, right before I was fixing to give him his car back. Um, said, you should tell the news about what you, you're doing for this young man and let them know that we're not going to stand for bullying and bigotry. And, um, you know, uh, and so I took Grandma's advice and I reached out to the local news stations and Channel 7 took the bait and wow. they came and covered the unveiling of uh, giving um, young Jordan his car back. And when they did that, um, their social media post went viral. Um, and this was before Facebook got too crazy big, but you know, it went viral. Um, and uh, within a week, you know, our mailbox was flooded with letters from all over the world. Um, wow. You know, phone calls, packages, people calling us crying, you know. Um, and then uh, within a week, my grandmother gets a phone call and she, she yells into my office, the, the Ellen Degenerate show was on the phone for me. And I was like, is this, <laughs> is this a prank call? Is this like Ashton Kusher on Punked or whatever? I was like, what is, what is, what's going on? And so um, sure enough, the Ellen show was calling me and they were, um, were like, we heard about what you did. Um, you know, we want you on our show in two weeks. And, you know, as I'm sure you're probably aware, um, you know, with producing stuff, a lot of times some of these larger shows are probably planned out weeks ahead of time, months ahead of time, you know, with guests and stuff scheduled. They had to bump somebody right. um, to put me on their show, and they wanted us to be their star guests for wow. their season 10 premiere. It was two weeks away, and so... Uh, two weeks later, man, um, they flew Jordan and I out to uh, Hollywood, um, uh, to Burbank. Uh, that's where their studios were. Mm -hmm. um, and like you see on the movies where they've got the guy holding the sign with your names on it, you know, <laughs> that happened. And they put us in a big, giant black limo and drove us to Hollywood Boulevard and put us up in the Roosevelt. And uh, wow. they, they, they filmed, um, you know, they did a story about us. And... Um, that was life-changing, to say the least. Oh, yeah. um, and then yeah. they, they did one even better. They surprised me, and they, uh, they not only they gave me $25,000, wow. 
um, but then they made my father a commercial for his business that featured Ellen DeGeneres, Pink, Patrick Dempsey, and three of the Fab Five Olympic gymnasts. All of those were guests on the show that day. Um, and they made a commercial that was kind of improv, and um, then Cox Communications, in, uh, not Cox, maybe Comcast, one of the local cable television peeps, uh, mm -hmm. they aired it on their, their network for a year for free. And wow. not like, you know, 3 a.m. Bob Ross channel, <laughs> like it was on prime time wow. for a year for free. Um, and so the money was awesome. I ended up dumping probably three quarters of it, I think like 19 grand or so. I gave it to my father. I was like, you need this more than I do. The business needs this more than I do, you know. Um, and uh, the biggest impact for me was the reaction that I got from the world. And ironically enough, on the plane ride home from, um, from LA, you've got the in-flight movies that you can watch. And one of the choices was the movie called The Bully Project. And if you've never seen The Bully Project, I, I advise you look it up. Um, and it'll, 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 it might get you emotional, but if anything, it, it, it pissed me off. Um, and, and, in, and in that instance, I was like, I have to do something with this 15 minutes of fame. I've got to do something positive. You know, I've got to try to you know, ride this wave for good. And so in that moment, I started Quality Cares Automotive, which at first was going to be sort of a nonprofit of sorts to overhaul a deserving recipient's vehicle every year um, for free. And, um, you know, I ended up doing, um, I think, uh, a few other restorations. Um, you know, a, a disabled kid, we pimped out his walker. Um, uh, uh, a young girl committed suicide because of bullying and her little brother had a go-kart that was hers that was their prized possession and we tricked it out and pimped it out um, and made it pretty awesome. Um, then the Roanoke Rescue Mission, um, the homeless shelter here in Roanoke, they have a women and children's center and they have a van that during the summertime months would take the women and children to a, a camp, I believe, out in Floyd for like these day trips to just get them away from, you know, the, the, the hellish lifestyle these homeless folks are used to and get them out into nature and just try to give them the opportunity to forget about it. Well, this Women and Children's Center's van was pretty rough shape. Um, and again, I saw the opportunity to take life's lemons and make lemonade out of it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I tricked out their, their ride. I, I put a, uh, a bubble maker inside this thing and, and, and had the whole inside of this van wrapped in a, uh, a theme that was um, kind of cartoonish because it's going to be a bunch of kids riding in this thing. And so it was like this cartoonish theme of Roanoke and the surrounding areas and like the star and the Dr. Pepper sign and whatnot. And there was a bubble maker that we fabricated into the back of this van to where the driver could hit a button that was on a key fob. And the gas, a, a, a gas door out of a S10 that we grafted into this van would open up and this industrial bubble maker that you'd see at a rave would just start spewing bubbles out of the back of this van. <laughs> and the kids loved it. Wow. Um, and that was the last uh, vehicle that I did because um, that year, the stress and the overhead just got too much for my father and for myself. Um, and there were more instances than I can count where I recall rifling through my dad's desk and his glove box to pull the clip out of his gun because I knew that that was on the table, that he was that bad. And I, I, after going through listening to what my wife went through, um, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't be a part of that anymore. And so in March of 2015, um, just after my wife and I decided to sell our house and buy land with no house on it and decided that we were going to build a house out of pocket with zero building experience and we were going to buy a camper and live in it and do the whole tiny house lifestyle, um, I made the hardest decision of my life and I decided to leave my father's business. And on national TV, I told Ellen and the rest of the world that I was his retirement plan that he didn't have a 401, and that I was the fallback, and that I had to make sure that we were successful. 
and I was having to break that promise and leave because I couldn't continue drinking myself to sleep. I couldn't see him go through this kind of stress every day. And so I just had to listen to my therapist and, and, and realize that my stress was situational and I needed to get out. Um, and so I did. And I spent, um, you know, six months helping my father close his business, put everything in storage, renovate my house, or finish renovating it, getting ready to sell, etc. While meanwhile living in a camper, trying to figure out how to build a house. So I started Quality Cares Automotive as a as a automotive shop, essentially to keep my old man busy. And you know, on paper it looks like I'm a one man wrecking ball, but really I'm just handling, I'm juggling the administrative side of it. Um, while my old man is the magician behind the scenes, um, and he keeps it going until he can, you know. I'll, I'll keep it going as long as he could swing a hammer, but he has maybe six more house payments and his house will be paid off and wow. he won't have to work as hard anymore. Um, we were halfway through building our house. We had a roof over our head. Um, we were in between living in the house and the camper and some makeshift sheds that we were in. And um, I think two years into it, so probably around 2017, my um, wife came out of the closet. Um, which was a kick in the dick, to say the least. Um, and the learning curve was super steep. But my first reaction was not anger. You know, obviously I was a bit sad at first, but it was that of empathy and trying to understand and, and, and putting her life story and putting all the pieces together, it all started to kind of click and it made sense. And we talked about it. As I mentioned, communication is key in any situation um, and we realized that it, it was it was right and that she you know is, is lesbian and um, that is what it is and we had to figure out how to move on from there but I was you know tired of living in a camper I was tired of you know pooping in a bucket I wanted hot water um, you know I was trying to run this business that I created to help my father um, and then this happens, you know, so I ended up kind of isolating myself to the attic for a while. And, um, you know, I had stopped drinking for a stint and it was cold turkey for sober for a couple years. Um, but my other crutch was marijuana. And so I, I smoked a lot at this time. Um, and um, I recall uh, living with my wife and, and, and her girlfriend at the time while they finished the house that I, you know, started. Um, wow. And uh, needless to say, I started running out of fucks to give and was like, I've got to focus on me. I've spent my entire life helping others and doing for others. Um, I've got to take these next, you know, this next chapter of my life and really focus on myself for a bit and get myself headed in a positive direction that suits me. And so 2018, I decided to um, utilize my Montgomery GI Bill um, and, and join college, you know, um, at 32, not having a clue what I wanted to do. But I went into the advisor's office and we talked about the programs and having kind of an engineering background of sorts, I figured that would be the path of least resistance. So I started pursuing um, a mechatronics um, engineering degree with a focus in design and um, Two years later, um, I graduated with a 4.0 um, and decided to pursue a bachelor's in mechanical engineering technology, which um, I'm officially a senior um, there now and have a year left to finish. Um, wow. Meanwhile, I became um, the project lead on a humanitarian project at our school through Engineers Without Borders, where we are, are um, responsible for designing, building, and fundraising this project for a town of 800 people and roughly 200 houses in La Reforma, Guatemala that doesn't have running water to their houses. And, and we take for granted so many things. And my experiences in the military and such have really changed my perspective on the world. And I often joke, you know, first world problems. You know, mm -hmm. we don't realize how good we have it. And so, I heard about Engineers Without Borders and knew that this was up my alley and this is some, a project I want to be a part of. So um, 
you know, we're, we're pretty much done with the design phase and we hope to start implementation, you know, in the spring. Regarding, you know, transitioning um, from the military, I think that there's, um, there's programs out there. It's just vets need to not be afraid to ask for help. Um, and, and, and getting these programs in front of them is another hurdle that I don't even know where to begin to start. And so I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that vets like yourself have teamed up with Adam, who is a marketing genius of sorts and, and knows how to get, you know, uh, an important message in front of the right people. And so I think you're, you're definitely on the right track there. And, and regarding homelessness, man, I, I, I still don't know what I'm going to do with my education, but I've often had these um, ideas, if you will, um, <laughs> where I'm a little stoned and trying to think of how I'm going to save the world with my education and my skill set. I'm kind of a jack of all trades, but master of definitely none of them. But with enough time, resources, and YouTube, I can, I can figure anything out. And you would not believe the amount of waste that we create as a society. And when I'm talking waste, I'm talking things that we could build houses out of. We could build temporary structures out of for vets, for people that are transitioning from A to B, you know, homeless folks, whether they're vets or not, yeah. you know. And there are, there are places out there like Habitat for Humanity and stuff. Like, where's the veteran Habitat for Humanity? You know, uh, these one percenters, you know, have got more money than God. You know, uh, Jeff Bezos could sneeze and end world hunger. You know, where is the, 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 the veteran Jeff Bezos of sorts? that wants to sneeze and, and, and fund some, you know, veteran homeless project, you know, put me on the payroll and just pay me in food and shelter and we will solve veteran homelessness. Um, you know, I, I want to be a part of something like that, that matters, that makes, that makes a difference and is part of the solution and not the problem. Well, it's clear you got a huge fucking heart, man. Yeah. It's, uh, I thank you for being here, Richard, and fucking thank you for your service. My and, pleasure. Uh, thank you for every. Uh, thank you for your continued service, man. These stories are fun. These stories are amazing, man. And uh, you're a special person. I appreciate it, man. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. Push it to the limit. I can't go no more. Red light.